Hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to Magia Mindset. Today's guest has been an assistant coach at Syracuse University and currently is the UCR men's soccer head coach. Welcome, Tim Capello. Roll the intro. Sean. How are you doing? Thank you for joining us. I know your schedule is busy, especially during this time. I know because of the NCAA voluntarily training starting up and stuff like that, you got your hands full. Um, it feels like during this coronavirus, coaches' are, hands are actually more full than they were um, yeah. during the off seasons or season. This is usually the time you guys have done your recruiting, you guys are relaxing and going and they're just recovering until you group with the season in uh, in the summer so again I appreciate you putting in the time and um, the pleasure having you on and we want to just right off the bat get started with um, you kind of telling us your journey your story how you got to where you got to today yeah well first thanks for having me um, it's certainly an interesting time in, in everybody's life and whether they're you're a player or a coach or just, you know, somebody outside of the sport. Um, I think everyone's, like you said, busy juggling personal life and professional life and, um, you know, kind of where my journey started. I mean, it, it goes all the way back to, you know, my youth. I, I was fortunate enough where my father was a collegiate coach, so I grew up around the game. Um, I grew up in western New York, Rochester, New York. Um, is where I was born and raised. Um, you know, my dad played professionally back in the old NASL. And once he retired from there, he got into college coaching. So I basically grew up as a coach's son um, and was immediately drawn to it. Right? I mean, like from my year, earliest ages, I was, you know, his ball boy. I would go with him on team road trips when I could get out of school and, um, you know, just – enjoy being on the team bus and staying in the hotel with the guys and interacting with the guys and kind of emulating them, right? Th those college players back then were kind of my models when I was a little kid, you know, I thought they were the, the coolest people on the earth. Um, besides obviously the, the footballers that I watched on TV and, you know, back in those days, it was one game on a weekend or maybe two games on a weekend and we didn't have the, the luxury of all the games going on now. Um, so that was my, my initial introduction to the game. And, you know, my father uh, was born in Brazil, but he's an Italian uh, family that actually immigrated from Brazil to Italy, Italy to the U.S. Um, so grew up in a very passionate soccer family. Um, depending on where the aunts and uncles and cousins were born, half of them are Brazil fans, half of them are Italy fans. So there's always a big kind of war in our house, especially back in the 94 World Cup. I remember, you know, everybody stayed home. Nobody answered each other's phone calls. Um, so that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, but, you know, from then, just obviously got into playing and loved the game, loved playing. Um, but I always knew I wanted to coach. You know, obviously as a little kid, everybody sort of has that dream to be a professional player. Um, but as I got into my teenage years, you know, I, I kind of realized that the professional path wasn't going to be a reality for me. So immediately started thinking the game and trying to play the game more as like a coach on the field. Um, and yeah, right away, just it's new. I needed to start to put in my work from the coaching standpoint. So I uh, tried to expose myself to as many different people as I could in my network. Um, you know, tried to work hard, volunteer, did a lot of things that, you know, my time as a player started to turn more into coaching, um, worked a lot of camps, um, and just started to kind of learn my trade from there, basically. Now that's great. I mean, there's some key points you said in that, like how your father played, your father was a coach, as well as um, you realizing what your niche was, was it being a coach? And you started to say, you know what, playing-wise, I can't make the living compared to coaching wise. 
you know, and you lived in a soccer family in that sense to see both ends of it from your father's perspective. You know, there's a lot of kids that are passionate about this game. They love it, but sometimes maybe they, they're grown into a, uh, born into a family with, that has an education background. Uh, the game, the sport, it's just sports in general is looked upon as a hobby. It's not a career. You can't coach it. You can't make a career from it. So a lot of them tend to go the typical of his education camaraderie, engineer, doctor, lawyer. And that might not be their natural passion, but they transition because the sports world that they love growing up was just thrown to them as a hobby. You know, what do you kind of, what's your message in that point of, you know, you obviously were brought up into that community, you know, Brazilian father, Italian family, kind of that passion behind it. How do, how do you kind of elaborate a message to the younger generation that maybe don't have that environment and, but they love the game? Where do they find that inspiration to continue to love it to a, you know what, I can do something with this if it's as a player or a coach? Yeah, I think it starts with passion, right? And to your example before, we see this a lot at the collegiate level is, you know, guys come in with the dreams of being a professional player or still wanting that pursuit, right? Especially at the division one level. Um, but certainly there comes a time where you have to prepare yourself for that next step. Um, so there's a balancing act, right? It's if you're a kid that wants to make soccer your your dream again as whether it's a player or as a coach or in front office or you know management agents or whatever it may be um you know you find a way to pursue something that you're passionate about and really fully commit yourself right um if it's something else if you want to be a teacher if you want to be a doctor if you want to be an engineer a plumber or whatever you know as as i tell my athletes and i was always told by my fathers and my coaches and you know I've got two young kids that someday I'm going to you know pass this message on to them as well is whatever you do do it with your full extent whatever your, your full potential is um, invest yourself really dive in you know and don't be afraid to you know get knocked down every once in a while don't be afraid to do some of the the grunt work that maybe isn't quite as glamorous you know especially in the beginning um, and then if you get the opportunities to kind of build up and, and get to maybe higher levels of that profession, you know, stay humble enough to remember what it took you to get there. You know, don't be afraid to do some of that grunt work still as you progress within your career. Um, you know, and I think you see that from some, some stars on, on professional teams, right? They still understand the importance of maybe playing roles in certain matches or in certain environments maybe they play a different role with their club than they do with their their national squad um because i think that they understand the importance of uh, really fully committing to a process and trying to achieve something as a team and that's the beauty i think of, of sport um is it teaches you so many different things right and you can really grab a hold of this game and and really develop and become the best player you can if you're willing to sacrifice and maybe put some other things aside. Um, but at the same time, if you don't become that pro, or maybe if you don't even become the coach or whatever it is that you maybe wanted to be as a, as a kid, uh, you know, take those lessons you learned and start to invest them into whatever that next passion is that you find along the way. Oh, that's, uh, that's great. That's great. Um, Another thing is, uh, Tim, you're in a unique situation how you, um, I mean, you're coaching at, your head coach at UCR. You're also coached at the DA level. So different, different umbrellas, meaning you put a different hat on the way your season platform is. The DA kind of represents the international, the year round. And the NCAA Division One. you're so compacted as well in the season. Um, if we dissect, let's say, from the age of 12 to 22 age frame within our U.S. development cycle, 
you know, how we have so much different platforms. If it's, you know, NCAA and you're going from August till November, then you got the DA. Well, actually, the DA is going to be interesting how it revamps again. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be interesting to see. But your experience with the DA and the direction we're heading to, because it, we're in a very great time with the 2026 World Cup coming to the, to the U.S., um, as well as um, North America. How do we improve it? Or is it good as it is currently? The infrastructure of the NCAA, you're like, no, this is great. I love periodization like this. Uh, the DA complements that. Or do we need to make some strides? And what would it be to kind of, it feels like we're knocking at that international step, you know, but we're always falling a little short of, if it's developing that number 10 or developing that team that can get us over that hump. Um, so I, I want to kind of dissect that more. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and there's so many different directions you can take with an answer to this question. Um, I mean, certainly the DA system, I think, had a lot of positives. Um, if you go and watch the, I think, individual player development over the past, whatever it was, 12 years or whatever the DA was around, um, I do think the, the overall level of player within the DA system certainly improved. Um, you can, depending on your eye and your, your, your vision of how the sport should be played, um, some people can be critical about the style that the game was played in. Um, was it too rigid? Was it too much of a mandate from U.S. soccer that every team had to play a certain way and it kind of became a little bit cookie cutter? Um, or did it give enough freedom to clubs to allow them to maybe implement their own style and develop their own type of player? Um, and I always had this conversation with our staff um, with FC Golden State and other staffs in, in Southern California and around the country that I knew was, I didn't think as much needed to be mandated by U.S. soccer. I believe each club should have its own identity, um, and their identity should be from top down, right? First team down to their U12 academy or whatever their, their lowest age group was. Now, if you didn't have an MLS club, if you didn't have a USL club, you know, maybe it was your U19s were your, you know, your elite team. Um, but have a methodology all the way from the top down and develop them to play a certain way. Um, now, when Greg Berhalter comes calling or U.S. soccer coach X after Greg comes along and says, you know, I want to play a certain system within our country. Well, I know that FC Golden State develops really good center backs. Well, I'm going to go try and find the center back from that club. Or I know FC Dallas develops really good 10s. Well, I'm going to go grab a 10 from FC Dallas. You know what I mean? So because of the identity of the club, I think it makes it easier for the national system to go and scout the players they want to fit in their style, right? Because we all know that, you know, Burhalter's style may be different from Sarakin's, different from Arena's, different from Klinsman's, and that's just the nature of the game, right? Whoever's at the top is going to try and play a slightly different type of system or a different type of philosophy. Um, but if the clubs that they're scouting from have a true identity, I think it's easier to kind of feed into that national system. Right. Um, now, the collegiate side, I think there's some, some good and bad that comes with it. Um, the good side of it is I think there's – every game means something. So there's a lot of competitive fire that goes into those few months of our season. Um, the players work extremely hard. They kind of learn how to grind things out, which I do think the DA system is kind of – pulled that identity out of our, our nation a little bit is because again, things are so cookie cutter for a while that that kind of grit and that grind kind of went away a little. Um, but certainly the college game has some flaws too. As you mentioned, it's, it's a short period of time. Um, it's a condensed schedule. The, the substitution rules are a little bit crazy. Um, so it doesn't really replicate what they do on the international stage. Um, but as we all know, not every single player at the age of 18 or 19 is going to go sign a pro contract. So where do they go from there? Right. Um, obviously there's more USL opportunities and 
you know, NISA opportunities and stuff like that popping up in our country. Um, but there, I think there's a pathway for players between that 18 to 22 year range um, that people are going to kind of take different paths and see what they can make of it. Um, our job at the collegiate level is to try and make the college game better. Right. And we're trying to do that. We're, we're pushing forth initiatives to try and stretch out the season, make it longer, we're pushing forth initiatives to try and alter the substitution rule. Um, you know, we've adopted the new FIPA playing laws as far as the, you know, playing out of the back and, you know, set pieces inside your 18, don't have to leave the 18 and all those sort of things. But, um, you know, we know, we know as college coaches that there's room to grow and, and we're certainly pushing hard for that, especially at the D1 level. No, no. I mean, and there's so much you can do too. You, there's so much you guys can do personally. My thing is, I was like even thinking as recently that I found out like the athletes, I think they can, um, at the NCAA, correct me if I'm wrong, um, they can now make money off their jerseys and stuff. I don't know if NCAA is clearing that in the future or anything like that. Um, but I was even thinking about, you got the MLS first division. Okay. Then you got the second division. I would say I wanted to be affiliated with MLS. I think we got so much like MLS, USL, NASL, uh, NISA, NISL. There's so many different leagues. So if we have MLS and we have another league that is the second division, if it's USL that becomes the second to MLS, and there is a promotion relegation, like you just said, there's something you're playing for. And I was even thinking the third division is – NCAA Division One, you make it year round, but the athletes within the NCAA are not professional. They're not being paid athletes. They're they're competing year round within that. But if they win the league, they get promoted to that second division. How how you compete against the professionals? Okay, but you're not a professional athlete. You're still in the institute, but you get those as a part of development. Could you look at it? If you weren't make, able to make it as a pro at 17, 18, from 18 to 22, you're playing at a third division, possibly get to play with those. So, you know, you kind of scratch the MLS draft, but you go like that because now that whole hunger of can we get there? And then as a coach, you probably can go in an angle and look, this is what it is. If you want to get there, you're just not ready to go at 18, at 17. But look, you're still, you get to see. For me, I look at it as a whole nation thing. If, if we make those changes within it, how can uh, you guys in the situation you guys are go year round, have uh, these gaps. At the, it's, it makes it hard for any coach when you have the gaps of spring season and fall season, and then you got the spring season with certain restrictions of it. Uh, it there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that go into it that – other sports don't – it, it doesn't impact the other sports because the other sports don't compete with the world. And I think we compete with the structures of Germany, Holland, and they have a structure, and you're like, that's the way the sport of football is. You know, basketball, NCAA, hey, dude, some of the best athletes are still at the NCAA, so it benefits the development. For us – right. What basically long story and I'm transitioning to you is how, how do we get away from creating our sport like the way the business of American football is, the way the business of basketball is? It feels like we that's our model. That's our model. We try to go in here instead of, um, you know, your roots are from Brazil, from Italy. I think we got to see because U.S. is a land of immigrants we got to see what is it that we can take from everything. And this is the model that kind of works in that. Like what's in your opinion, a good business model for development, um, not more uh, financial. Yeah. Again, that's a, it's a complex question. And, and I wish I, I had the, the perfect answer for it. Um, I think when you look at, the NCA model, right? Unfortunately, this was implemented way back 50 plus years ago um, when ultimately our sport wasn't at the heights it is now within our country. And 
a lot of soccer players would you know play soccer in the fall they'd go play basketball in the winter and then they'd run track or play baseball or something in the spring and there's a two to three sport model per year um and coaches were doing the same thing you know there, there were very few you know soccer coaches back then that were soccer people right they were a phys ed guy that kind of coached soccer on the side or something along those lines so i think unfortunately our scholastic system both high school and and collegiately are still kind of stuck in that model. And I think that's what we're trying to, as a coaches association, really push to, to create that change because, you know, you brought up a good point about basketball, right? Basketball is probably, you know, our country's best sport as far as like, you know, maybe football as well, um, world domination and developing players here. But I honestly think they're starting to realize that, there might be a better system and you can see a lot of professional basketball organizations are kind of mimicking the soccer structure they're going around the world and i believe now there's a i think they call it the g league the gatorade league um which is sort of taking place of college for some athletes and instead of going and being that that one and done college basketball player they're bypassing college and they're going into the g league and what the NCAA is going to have to start to realize is, look, if they don't restructure, they're going to lose their relevancy within basketball, right? Um, and I think soccer, we're kind of pushing for not so much from a professional and relevancy standpoint. We're pushing more for it from a kind of health and well-being of our athletes because we, we ask too much out of them in the fall and then too little out of them in the spring. Um, but it kind of goes hand in hand. And if, if the NCAA is going to, probably do one for one sport they should do one for the other um but again it's, it's hard to make change when things have been kind of set in their ways for decades and decades and decades all right um back to our, our our country's overall development i don't think it's any secret to anybody that pro rel is a huge factor um and in allowing that free market of clubs to develop and compete and climb the ladder and, you know, if they can get to that next division, if they can go from third to second or second to first. Can they survive? You know, do they have a strong enough business model to succeed at that level? Um, or are they going to get knocked back down? And the nature of it is that's, that's how it is all around the world. Like some survive and some don't. Some kind of teeter back and forth every few years. And, and that's just the reality of kind of the economics that go behind the club game all around the world too, right? Um, I don't know if or how, you know, the MLS slash USL can join and kind of become like a partnership. Um, being a witness to what my dad went through when he played in the NASL and how that league folded and how our country was kind of without like a legitimate, consistent professional league for so long, um, you know, in the 80s and early 90s. I see the the importance of what the MLS did and how they came in and established themselves, um, kind of closed the market and said, this is how we're going to build the league. This is how we're going to establish the league, make sure nobody goes bankrupt or, you know, very few owners lose their, their clubs or franchises, whatever you want to label them as. Um, I think they did a very good job of growing the league that way, right? To make sure that like the old days of New York Cosmos don't come in, build up the roster full of all the stars around the world and just demolish everybody else. And then the other markets can't survive. But I think maybe now we're at a point where the, the, the league can maybe tweak their model and maybe start to open things up a little bit. Um, certainly it's going to be hard to convince the higher ups and all the, the owners to do that because they, they bought in for a certain reason. Um, but yeah, the purists in me would, would love to see an open market and, see what the, the little clubs can do over a five to 10 year period of trying to build their way up. We'll see. No, no. I mean, it's, it's always great dialogue. You know, I think in, in America, um, it's such an amazing place to live in because the amount of resources we have, the amount of uh, access we have. I mean, if, if we, if we travel the world, we realize like when I went to Iran to even play there, when I went to Iran, I played at the highest level in Iran. Okay. And, 
NCAA Division I facilities were, had better facilities than some of the clubs I played for at the highest level. Our grass, our grass is probably, you go to a youth complex, like Surf Cups Complex or, um, you know, Galloway Downs, one of those, that's how it was. And we know Division I um, facilities had even better facilities than that. So when I look at that is the amount of, like, some of these um, – Players, some of these young athletes don't realize how good they have it here compared to a lot. I mean, even in Brazil, a lot of the third world countries, they have quality of players, but the resource, the access, like, I mean, at your facility, you guys have a sports performance coach, you have your nutritionist, they have a, a, a coaching staff. Like, it, for some, this is top level. In some countries, this is top level. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see the direction it is going because even when you look at it from your child, the time your dad played, oh my God, the stuff they had then now to what these kids are like, I wish I was born in this time. The YouTube, if I was able to watch the YouTube behind the scenes, like you can get behind the scenes of every professionals. You can get behind the scenes videos for every universities. You're like, dude, I can watch what they're doing. If I have any idols, I don't have to go to a library to read about them. I don't have to jump a fence to watch them. So I totally agree. I mean, there's so much stuff they have. If like, if you have a younger brother, knowing what you know is like, oh man. And if he loves it, there's stuff you can do to allow that. So I agree with you. I think we are heading in the right direction. I think as uh, you as a nation, we just want it more right now, more right now. Right. But I think we, we are getting there. I think when we look from um, 2007, it's way better. From 97, from 87, it is growing. The game is growing. It is becoming better. The coaches are better. The coaches are better. I mean, you just said it. There was an uh, instructor, a PE uh, instructor that was teaching. But the, everything's improving in that. And that's why I want to kind of segue into our next point is kind of uh, discuss more about you and kind of break down your coaching style, kind of give us a, a access of your coaching style, your demeanor. What is it that um, you demand from your team? What are um, the culture and environment you try to create within any team you're a part of? It, it doesn't mean that UCR, any team that you've been a part of and you've ran it is what is it that they're like, you know, this is coach Tim team this is my imprint this is the way we play um and kind of um elaborate on that yeah so one i think for me um i love to have a, a team that can play with the ball right and build so when you look at the actual style of the plays is i want guys that can be intelligent enough technical enough to be able to solve problems um so we look at trying to build as much as we can we look at trying to possess the ball through the, the phases of the field. Um, but we, we try to be smart enough to recognize what kind of tempo the game can kind of dictate to us or what we can kind of read from the game and implement as far as the tempo play. So, you know, do we want to get forward quickly? Do we want to kind of possess and, and uh, create some overloads or find some space some in different channels of the field? Um, you know, from what we try to find a lot within our team is where can we find either numerical or spatial advantages on the field? Okay, so what is our opponent doing defensively to try to either press us or set us up with some sort of like mid-block defensive line where they're looking to invite us into a certain area? And if we can recognize what they're trying to do, well, then how do we sort of draw them into that and quickly understand how to escape it? Right, so I want to invite pressure to break pressure. Um, at the same time, if the space is behind lines quicker, the space is behind the back four or the back three or whatever they're playing, and we can expose them early, then we'd be foolish not to, right? So um, you don't want to get kind of confused on, hey, we want to be a possession-oriented team. It's no, we want to score goals and we want to win, but we do believe that with intricate passing and intelligent passing is the best way to kind of break down a team um, based on the skill set that we have within our group as well. Um, now, the environment that we talk about, 
you know, I want every single day to be competitive within our training environments. Um, it starts from, you know, when we, we show up to the field and we start with our simple little rondos in the beginning is, you know, those should be competitive. It's not just a kind of a fun warm up kind of joke around, you know, 15 minutes. It's, you know, let's get this ball zipping. Let's get it moving. Let's, you know, the defenders should be working hard. Um, there be, should be some sort of point structure or wind structure to it, whatever our topic may be, right? Whether we're scoring the defensive group or scoring the, the team in possession or whatever. Um, maybe it's a, a moving rondo that we have to kind of switch grids. Um, but there's some sort of score to it. And there's a, a little bit of a reward or a little bit of a penalty for the losers or, you know, maybe it's just kind of a, a kind of a, you know, a teammate having fun and jabbing at your teammate saying, hey, I got you, I beat you, you know. And that kind of gets the competitive juices flowing. And then from there, you know, we move into whatever the, the kind of bigger, broader picture is of the session. Um, but, yeah, everything's competitive. Um, you know, I want guys fighting for spots. I want guys, um, you know, being upset if they lose or being upset if maybe we split into an 11 aside, you know, you know, game towards the end and they're not on that first team. They should be a little bit upset about that, but at the same time, it should be a healthy environment where um, they know, okay, tomorrow's my next chance to kind of go back and, and regain my spot. Or, you know, this guy beat me today, but I'm going to go try and beat him tomorrow. Um, and it's a, it's a healthy team competition. Nobody takes it personal. You know, nobody, you know, carries stuff off the field into the locker room. Um, you know, it's, it's, for me, competition is what breeds success. And if people go about it the right way, then it can be healthy. Um, you know, I don't know if you or, or many people that will be watching this podcast or probably just finished watching The Last Dance with, you know, Michael Jordan, the Chicago Bulls. I mean, that's a, probably a bit of a unique team environment, but you see the drive that an athlete like that has and the environment that he kind of creates. Also, the environment that Coach Phil Jackson sort of fosters and allows to be created um, and how certain athletes thrive and rise in that occasion and some might kind of cower and, and fall out, right? So it, it's interesting, you know, I'm sure if you walk into a, a professional environment, you're going to have some team or some players that are kind of welcoming and nurturing to the young players that, you know, new sign, new drafted, whatever hey, this is how you do it. Let's, let me kind of show you the ropes. And you're going to have the other ones that make them earn it more, right? Hey, you need to show me that you belong here before I help help you along and kind of show you the ropes along, right? And every player is going to respond differently, right? And I think that's part of their development. Like how do you step into a team environment as a player and make the most of it? Is it somewhere that you can grow and and push yourself and say, okay, this is a little bit uncomfortable, whether it's the coach that's making me uncomfortable or the veteran that's making me uncomfortable or whatever, but that uncomfort is going to force me to, to develop more as a player. Um, so in a long story short, that's kind of what we try to, to create at UCR. Um, at the academy level, I try to do that more from kind of the outside because I'm a little bit more of like an assistant coach in, in the role there. So I sort of do more of like the floating around and kind of talking to guys sort of individually, um, just making sure that their mentality is right. And, you know, they're not getting a little bit too loose because, you know, they're still young kids and we all play this game because we love it. So a lot of times it's, it's a fun environment. Um, you just want to make sure that the fun is, you know, that energy is directed in the right way. And um, like what I always tell them is to me, the fun is the competing. The fun is the winning. The fun is the, that, you know, running at your buddy, and trying to beat them one v one, or being that team that out possesses the other team in, in a you know rondo game or whatever. Um, and if you win that, like that's exciting to me. If the guy's trying to run at me one v one, and I know I'm going to get him on a tackle, like that's fun to me. I can have a little jab and jaw at him afterwards. Like to me, that that's the fun part of being on a team. No, it's 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 great how you explain culture, and it's funny how you brought up the last dance. Um, there's a, been a few interviews, and I was going to kind of take it there as well. Um, few interviews that we've had that we've brought up the last dance. It's been fresh because one of the one of the platforms that we discuss in this is mindset. I think more important than talent or anything, it's the mentality uh, of the individual. 
Um, I think if you go to Ronaldinho's days at Barcelona, Clivert said he was a player every time you needed to remind him he's good. You need to, to hug it. He wasn't like a very strong personality. Like he was always a happy guy that needed to be reminded that, hey, it's, dude, we love you. You're good. You're good. Even um, when Zlatan said when he was in, uh, you know, in Barcelona with Guardiola, his kind of thing. It's funny how as a coach, you got to realize what kind of pieces you have. How do you psychologically talk to individuals? You know, what are they? I mean, you dealt with athletes that have gone from your program and represented the U.S., have gone from your program or playing professionally, um, have previously come into your program playing at the highest level, coming into yours. So I wanted to kind of dissect in your environments that you have coached and the players you have dealt with, what is – we see the game, obviously. We all see the game. But we don't see the locker room. We don't see the, the actual work you guys put in and what you see of your athletes day to day as a human being. What is their makeup? What is that mentality? For like a lot of these athletes, I got to know what goes into it. What is, let's just say, the mindset you got to have to be able to get to a division one, to be able to surpass a division one, to go even higher because you've dealt with a lot at the DA at every level and you've had players that go on play at the highest I want to kind of dissect the mentality even even if if you want to tie it into the last dance because the last dance gave us glimpses of levels I mean when it broke down to even Michael Jordan's level I think to a point if someone has a friend like that you can't hang out with them because they're so obsessed that you're like dude I want to go out and just eat today you want to do just you just want to keep competing every second there's something wrong. Like, no, it's like, dude, all I do is basketball or all I do is football. That's the level. Of, there's a reason they're there and they're the best because they're actually, it's funny, they push a lot out of their way because they're so this. So if we can just discuss levels to levels to levels and what goes in each one uh, of the mindset and your perspective that you observe so much from a coach and even discuss the coaching mindset that it takes to deal with these players. Um, if we can break. Yeah, that, that's a, another really good question because I think it, it depends on the individual. Um, I'm a firm believer that, you know, you, you talked about the, the Ronaldinho and, and hugging him and kind of building him up. Um, that's, that's a coach recognizing what the player needs. Right. And, and to me, I think that's a, the most challenging part of coaching is understanding each player with so much depth in that relationship that you know which ones need that hug which one needs a you know kick in the backside you know which one needs that like rah rah, rah speech um, which one just needs to be left alone right maybe some of them need to be calmed down like there's everybody kind of has a different level of maybe intensity or anxiety or whatever going into competition um, but ultimately I don't believe that there's much coaches can do to motivate an individual, right? I think the motivation has come from within. Um, and you hear a lot of people talk about like, what's your why? Why do you do what you do? Um, you know, are you playing for a specific purpose? Are you training for a specific purpose? Um, hopefully it's not just a superficial thing like, oh, I want to be a star or I want to make a bunch of money. You know, hopefully there's something deeper within you that motivates you. Um, but I mean, from I oh mean, from like building our team. I remember years ago when I came in and as the assistant coach at the time, um, you know, the year prior was not a very good year for the program. And myself and the head coach, when we we joined together and the staff, and we said, "Look, we got to rebuild, and ultimately we need to go find winners. We need to find guys that aren't comfortable losing." And we did that, and. Um, you know, some guys were a little bit rough around the edges as far as being quote unquote good teammates. Um, but they were winners. And when they showed up to training, like they weren't accepting anything less than what was the high standard. So yeah, sometimes there was some scuffles in training. Sometimes there were some scuffles in the locker room. Um, some very frank conversations were had, um, but it wasn't to attack anybody. It wasn't to, you know, take any sort of personal agenda out on anyone who was, Hey, this is what is expected in order to win. 
And if you want to be a part of a winning group, we all need to start to rise to it. If you don't, fair enough. You know, no hard feelings. Make your decision. We're just going to go a direction without you. Right. And I think ultimately that's what happens a lot of times. Now, it doesn't mean you need to be this compulsive person like a Michael Jordan. Obviously, that worked for him and it worked for the Bulls. And believe me, I'm a huge Michael Jordan fan. I absolutely loved him as a kid watching him. Um, and I love this documentary. But some elite athletes have the ability to turn it on and off. They know when it's time to work and they're going to go work for those few hours a day or however many hours a day. And then they know, okay, now I'm going to go home and be a family person. Or, you know, me and my teammates are going to go grab some lunch or some dinner tonight and we're going to relax. Um, you know, there's other ones that, I mean, we've heard stories of, of Kobe Bryant, who he wasn't a guy that would go out at night, right, at certain points in his career, but he knew the importance of teammates and team camaraderie. So he said, okay, you guys want to go to a club? Well, I'll go to a club with you but you better wake up with me the next morning at 6 a.m. and meet me in the gym and we're going to train, right? So there's a, that give and take of, okay, I'm going to make sure that the guys know I'm, I'm with them, right? Like we're all bought in together, but what may happen off the field or off the court or outside the gym can impact what we're trying to do on the field too, all right? Um, so, there, I mean, there's so many different layers of what makes a player tick, um, you know, what – what's the reason I coach? What's the reason any coach coaches? Like what's our, our, our why as well. Um, but yeah, the, the, the biggest challenge I think is always finding those relationships with the players and really understanding how to, how to encourage them to, to play to their, their maximum potential or maybe exceed what they think is their potential, but you see something more out of them. Um, you know, I know I've had players come from overseas that have come from, you know, professional club environments who as a youth player within that environment, um, you know, they're kind of put in their place pretty early, right? They had some old veterans that said, you know, listen, kid, I'm not going to allow you to behave that way. Um, you're jeopardizing my paycheck. You're jeopardizing my ability to, to, you know, feed my family. Um, and I'm, I'm not talking about high level, you know, Serie A or Premier League clubs. I'm talking about, you know, third world European nations that, you know, aren't, aren't at the elite elite level, but these kids are on pretty high standards within their country. Um, when they come here, sometimes they're surprised with kind of the entitlement that maybe the academy kid comes to a collegiate environment with, you know, a kid that maybe has played on an MLS academy is used to getting all this gear and having all this stuff kind of handed to him, shows up and he's, still a 17, 18 year old kid on a college campus going up against maybe a 24 year old man who, you know, came from overseas. And he's like, why is this young kid talking to me the way that he's talking to me? Cause when I did that, when I was a kid, you know, my veteran smacked me across the face or whatever, you know, went in hard on me in a tackle and said, you better, you know, change the way you speak, you know, those sort of things. So again, it, I think it depends on the environment you want to foster as a coach. Um, but I see nothing wrong with a good, hard, disciplined session that allows players to one, you know, earn their way and earn the respect of the teammates. But again, it, it should be done in an effort to make the team as good as possible and to achieve the highest goals they could. Um, nothing should be, you know, personal vendettas or something along those lines. And I think it, depending on maturity levels of, of athletes, you, that can be a hard balance to find sometimes because, you know, you get yelled at by your buddy. Um, you could sometimes take it personal, you know, but if you look at it and say, well, he just wants the most, the best out of it for me because he wants the best for the team. I'm not going to take it personal. I'm going to raise my game, my level. Um, that's, I think, usually when you see a lot of growth. So um, I know for sure on our, our program, when we've had our best seasons, um, it's been because the locker room has been healthy and guys weren't afraid to have difficult conversations with each other because they cared about each other. And everybody knew that everybody was bought in. Everyone was willing to take, you know, those messages. Everyone was willing to give those messages. Um, there wasn't a hierarchy of, you know, I'm allowed to say this and you're not allowed to say that it was, we're in this together. 
Um, and I think that that's ultimately where the success has come from is when the locker room, the clubhouse, the whatever you want to call it, you know, is healthy and strong. No, no, no. That's great. I mean, we kind of discussed a little bit um, you having a rough season and you guys went in search of getting winners and find that. If I throw you a scenario and if you and if it ties into a story you have, please share upon it that you do have a group of winners and you kind of started touching based on it. The, the most success you had was when you had that group that had tough conversation. They weren't willing to hold back. Um, I want to kind of go into your coaching role now, not so much the, the mindset of the player. You have these winners, you have these competitors on the field. They, they just lose it. If they lose that one little game, if it was a small sided game, Winner stays on, they're losing, and they're just like, they can't take it inside, and they're making it show. And maybe to a point, it's, you're like, uh oh, should we get in? Uh oh, is it gonna get a little combative between the two players? And the other guy's just rubbing it in because he's a competitor, they're egging it on. It's like, hey, if, if you don't step up, I'm gonna keep showing you what's up. That, it's a great environment for a coach. You're like, dude, I, this, is, this is heated. My take is, the challenge is there. What do you do as a coach to say, this is good stuff. We don't get this every time. Let's let it play out. Let the, let the players solve it. Or, uh-oh, I got to step in on this and I can't let it. Like, when do you know I got to step in to guide it a different direction? Or you're like, I don't want to step in because if I guide it a different direction, it might take away from that aha winning culture and it's giving the mindset with the kids or the players that is, this is not good. And to be fair, you kind of need that to be ready for those moments too if you have that group. So like to me, I think that's so challenging. You're like, dude, my group's so talented. They're so competitive, okay? But they're too much competitive that I got to figure out ways to do it. And I want to know if you've had stories like that, please share on it. If, if not, if you haven't experienced that, what would you do if you're put into that situation? Yeah, I, I think everybody... Or I've experienced that a lot, right? I think most coaches do. Um, what I try to look for, it kind of ties into my last comments, was what's the personality of the players and what's the intent going on within those combative moments? Um, you mentioned first the player who's ultra competitive, wants to win everything, and if he starts to lose, he starts to unravel. Okay, well, I would try to have a conversation with that individual off the field and show him, you know, the, the stuff he should be focusing on isn't necessarily just the winning. It's what he does in order to win. Mm. Right. And, you know, he's going to go up against situations in the season where, you know, maybe he's having an off day. Maybe he's just going up against a really good opponent. Maybe some things outside of his control referees or, or whatever are happening. And, and it's just not, a perfect day for him. If he loses control of his, his psyche, then he's lost in that moment. He can't help us overcome that challenge, right? So you try to grow him from a psychological standpoint of, look, we all want to win, right? There, none of us are in this business to lose, um, but can we measure ourselves on something different than just winning, right? Knowing that if we hit all of those targets, um, maybe the winning is the byproduct, right? Or it at least gives us the best opportunity to win. Because in our game, and we all know this, it's one of the few sports that you can have a near perfect match and still lose, right? I mean, it's, it's you can't do that in, in basketball, right? I mean, if you're the better shooting team, you're probably going to end up winning that game usually, right? Um, but in our sport, like, there's 11 guys on the field and if I'm doing my job and one guy's not doing his job, well, we lose the game one zero or, you know, maybe I'm playing to 95% of my capacity, but I'm missing that 5% and I don't go finish that one chance that I get and we end up drawing or losing the game or something. Right. So there's a lot more that goes into it. Now, the other side you said about, um, you know, the player that is winning in training and he's kind of really taking shots at his teammate and he's kind of rubbing in his face. Okay, well, again, why is he doing that? Is he doing that because 
he's trying to push that player to raise his game. And he's saying, look, if you can't handle this in training, you're not going to be able to handle it, you know, in the 88th minute away when we're playing in front of 10,000 fans. Or is he doing it because he's trying to kind of establish his superiority over that guy? And it's more of a, a personal attack and a, like, you know, you attacked me earlier in the practice, so now I want to attack you. Or something along those lines. Like, to me, that becomes very catty. It becomes very, like, you know, junior high gossip in the hallway type of stuff. And we try to avoid that as much as we can, you know. Um, you know, we, we, I try to encourage our guys, like, look, if, if somebody calls you out for making a mistake or calls you out for not meeting our team standards, okay, accept it, find a way to improve it, but don't, like, I'm going to make a mental note. And the next time you miss a standard, I'm going to jump all over you because I got to even the score. No, like that's not the purpose of it. Right. We should all be held accountable to what we need. We feel are the important uh, core values within our team. Um, but it shouldn't become any sort of personal attacks, you know, and, and I think that's where you decide as a coach, am I going to step in here because it's getting a little bit catty or, you know what, this is a good moment for the players just to sort of sort out themselves and maybe at the end of the session you kind of wrap up with a message or maybe you don't mention it at all all right and you just kind of walk it away and say great session good job guys all right so i think every situation is a little bit different but i think those are the little cues that i look for no i mean that's deep that's deep i think it's so simple but it's so deep because uh, I threw scenarios at you where you can say, no, oh, we're going to let it play out. But you're dissecting. What is the intent behind it? That's so important. What is that intent? Because if the intent is that he's rubbing it in because he's like, dude, the level's not good enough. He wants to do something to motivate the, his opponent to take up the level too. You're like, that, that's, that's actually value. So I love uh, the way it's not just let's just let it go or not let it go. There's evaluation going behind the scenes. And that's huge. That's huge. Um, so I got basically one, one and a half question left. Uh, so we'll start off with this one. Obviously, Tim, this is a unique time with this pandemic. I mean, I can kind of say it within my lifetime, I've never experienced anything like this. I think it's a, it's a very unique time. Um, what I want to kind of say uh, and put it out there for you to have a message for our aspiring players, aspiring coaches, families during this time where you can't really go rub shoulders with people. You know, it's still, if it's anything, it's individual based. If it's anything, it's in your house watching videos. I think there's so much access to resources. Um, this is a good time to lay foundation work and be a planner and know that there's brightness at the end. What's that message you tell these families, these aspiring coaches, um, aspiring players to be doing? So, you know, we're coming back from this, from this time out, um, you know, stronger, the game stronger, the, the people behind the scenes are stronger. Um, so, yeah, we can dissect that a little bit. I think the, the question would be, how do you want to come back? Mm. Right. We're all going through this. It's a difficult time. Um, you know, I, you hear a lot of conversations about, well, we're uncertain what that quote unquote new normal is going to be, or we're uncertain when it's going to be safe again, or, or I'm frustrated because I can't do what I want to do. And, and there's, there's all these different emotions going on. Um, but, and believe me, it, it's natural. Like, it's okay to feel those feelings. It's okay to talk to somebody about those feelings. Um, I think it's important to, right, utilize the, the network that you have and whether it's somebody within your own home and you can talk to your immediate family or, you know, you're hopping on a phone or a Zoom or a, a FaceTime or whatever to, to connect with people, you know, have that connection. But at the end of the day, we are all going to have to get back to reality at some point, whatever that reality looks like. So what I ask of myself and what I've asked of my team during this time is, you know, where are you going to grow? What do you want to grow in during this period? Now, some of it may be completely athletic based. 
Okay. Some guys are, you know, working out at home and some guys are, you know, getting as many touches as they can at home. Well, some guys, you know, live in a small apartment and they don't have a yard. They don't have access to go out and do much. Um, so they're taking more of like a tactical approach and they're trying to watch games and watch videos and study the game. Maybe they're a really technical or athletic player, but maybe they haven't really thought the game through at a very high level. So they're trying to dissect tactics more. Um, other guys are trying to grow in things outside the game. They're meditating. They're, you know, working on cooking. You know, they're, they're trying to pick up things that just kind of grow themselves as human beings. Right. So whatever it is, and obviously we're in our sport world and, you know, I'm as the coach and guys are the players trying to prepare for our, our upcoming fall season. Um, we want to athletically be as prepared as possible, but at the end of the day, you always want to be growing as a person, right? The pursuit of knowledge should never stop, right? So um, find a way during this period to be a better version of yourself. When, when we show up back to campus in August, I want to see my guys as a better version of themselves, right? Now, maybe they're a little bit rusty, right, as players, and their technique is a little off, or they're not quite as fit as they would have been, but that's okay, as long as they're growing. And people around the world, find a way to grow, find something that you can try to pick up and add to your, your toolkit. And it, it's, there's a way to find some sort of silver lining in all of this, you know. Um, some people, it's, it's, they're fortunate now that they're able to spend more time with their family than they ever have before, right. I'm in that boat. I've got a a three-year-old and a one-year-old. If I was working every single day, I wouldn't be seeing them. Right now, you can probably hear them running around and screaming in the background. So it's it's one of those things that as busy I am with my work, I'm finding more time with my kids, which is, is great because it this opportunity will probably never come back again, right? So yeah, just find a way to, to grow yourself. And um, it's all about perspective, I think, really. No, fantastic message. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. Uh, thank you for elaborating on it. Um, last question. Um, and I want you to kind of tell us how it came about. Um, favorite team of all time and favorite player of all time. Both of them don't have to be in the sport of football, but obviously naturally you're a coach in the game. You've played it in the game, so it usually draws there. So uh, let us know what they are, but also – let us know how it came about to be those. Okay. Favorite team by far, Juventus. No question to ask. Um, I told you about family immigrating from Italy. Um, my grandfather, my, my father's father is a massive Juventus fan. So going over there every weekend um, for our, you know, uh, family dinners and stuff like that. And we'd, we'd be watching the Juve game in the morning. Uh, usually it was shown on, you know, there'd be one Serie A game played every weekend. Uh, sometimes it was Juve, sometimes it was, you know, one of the other teams I won't mention. Um, but he had, you know, the scarves and the posters and, and the pendants and every, like, everything, you know, all the memorabilia. So um, just watching him and how passionate he was during those games, it, it just it was a part of my blood and it, it still is, you know, since moving out here to California and Obviously, the, the time zone, sometimes you're waking up at six in the morning or whatever. And, you know, my wife thinks I'm crazy that, you know, I'll get up that early and watch a game and start screaming when goals are scored and that sort of stuff. But it's part of my blood. So Juve, forever and ever, that's, that's never going to change. How is the um, passion out there? Because like you said, you went out there. Because some, some people that never have traveled and they just played football or soccer in America – can you quickly, before you go and list your favorite player of all time, tell us how was it when you're watching a game over there or with your family that are watching it together? Um, well, it's funny. When, when I was in Turin in Italy, um, there's actually more Torino fans in that city than there are Juve fans. Juve is kind of like the big kind of, national brand that like the inner city people actually kind of take more pride in like Torino. So I would be walking around, you know, with like a Juve jacket and some guys making a comment to me, like, you know, um, 
comment I probably really shouldn't say, so I'm not going to, but uh, yeah, it was interesting actually being in, in Italy in that city when the two, there was a weekend where the two teams were playing in the Derby and uh, yeah, it, it, there's certainly not as many UA fans in that city as I would have expected. Um, but it's obviously a, a global brand, right? So you kind of go around the world and I think there's more there. Um, in our household, I would equate it to probably what a lot of other maybe families are like when maybe you've got a Barca family or a Madrid family or a I see your IX banner in the background. Like I'm sure a lot of families kind of have their own, you know, a lot of my team, you know, you got like your Chivas Guadalajara families or you got your Americas families and stuff like that. Like it's just, it's, it's intense, right? I mean, they're living and dying by every action in the game. And, you know, my, my Nono, my grandfather, he would, you know, be jumping out of his chair and yelling and screaming at the TV. And, you know, my grandmother's in the other room cooking and she's yelling at him to calm down. And it's just like, it was just, it was almost like you're in the stadium with that amount of passion and excitement going on during the games. Right. So um, again, it was kind of a no brainer for me to become a fan. Um, so yeah, it, it was certainly exciting and fun. That's beautiful. Um, yeah. Now see so your other question that the favorite player I think that's that's changed a little bit with as generations go on. Um, as a kid, while he was with Juve, I'd say Zidane was my favorite player. Mm. And I was kind of that hybrid central midfielder type player. Obviously, the game was very different back then. So, um, if it was in today's days, I would say I was a eight slash six type of a player. Um, Zidane was just a guy that I thought was so magical on the ball and he could do so many different things and you know he had that intelligence he had the power he had the physicality he had the the technique he i mean vision his passing and his i mean i mean it's just what he could how, do how great cerebral he was too what he did as a manager too i mean yeah yeah i mean he was he was phenomenal now obviously then you have the headbutt scenario against italy in the world cup and again i'm I've got this Italian side of my family, so there's a little bit of the, the villain in him too, or maybe savior in one sense too. Um, Don't defend him. And then, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but nowadays it's like, for me, it's how can you not love Messi? Mm. You know, I mean, what a phenomenal player, what he's done to our game and, and really changed the way people look at the game, I think. Um, you know, my dad and I will argue this all the time because, you know, my dad, again, was born in Brazil, played in the NASL, played against Pelé. So he feels Pelé is the best player ever. I didn't ever get to watch Pelé, right? But I've gotten to watch Messi. I tell him Messi's the best player ever. And, you know, we get into some arguments about that. But um, obviously him being Brazilian, he'll never accept an Argentinian as the best player ever. Uh, so it just... I, I think every generation is going to kind of have that hero. Um, but yeah, for me growing up, Zidane was, was awesome. No, I mean, that's, that's funny how you said the generation too, uh, because Pele, I mean, look, every, like the whole Michael Jordan, look, they have this it, but like LeBron is a better player. Kobe was a better player like these, because they watched the previous, the game has become better. I mean, Messi, what what they've done, even even Maradona improved the game at, at his extent. But to me, it's funny the debate of Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo. I think it's apples and oranges. Um, the, the thing I respect about both of them, and people got to realize, like, dude, they're doing it like for fifteen plus years. Like, I have never seen a professional level at the highest. It's like ball on the air, ball on the air, ball on the air, ball. I mean, like both of them, both of them is just insane what they've done. I, in any generation, I don't think there ever were one, two in the same era going back and forth. And they, they love going back and forth. They don't shy from it either. So that to me is like, appreciate it. And don't say, hey, Ronaldo's better than Messi. I mean, it's not comparable. Like you have styles. Like for me, I think Messi's the natural style. It's like natural. He goes, gets, Ronaldo's like the goal scorer, physical, athletic, and he puts in the hard work. So it's just like it's it's hard to compare. But I agree with you on Messi, man. He's he's something something. I think it's the same thing with 
I would say about Ronaldinho if he had the work ethic of Messi. I think if Ronaldinho had the work ethic of Messi, that, that he was something else too. And like when Messi gets the ball, you're like in the moment, you're like what, what's going to happen? What is he going to do? You know? Yeah, there, there's some players, as you said, like, you know, Messi or Ronaldinho that they do things that it just, your jaw drops. And you're like, I can't believe that player was just able to execute what he did or maybe even thought to do what he just did. You know, where uh, like Ronaldo is so talented. He worked extremely hard. And I'm not saying obviously Messi worked extremely hard too, but Ronaldo's kind of like built this machine of a player that is so efficient in everything that he does. Right. Um, another player I used to love watching as a, as a kid was Kaká. Cause I thought Kaká just made the game look simple and he would like very difficult tasks. He just would kind of knock the ball and just, it, it almost looked like he never changed pace. It was just like the game was very easy for him. Um, but yeah, I mean, you could, and we, we could sit here all day and talk about different players and stuff like that. I think there's players, you just say it, that as a coach, if you sit back, you're like, I think if he never trained, he still would have played at the highest level. You're like, some, some players, like the Brazilian Ronaldo, uh, Ronaldinho, you're like, Messi, you're like, I, they were born. doesn't matter what environment they grew up, someone was going to pick him up in that sense uh, just because, I mean, they're natural. But, mm-hmm. no, I, like I said, we, you can go all day talking about these kind of uh, players and the beauty they bring to the game and, uh, you know, the, heading the game in the right direction. But from my end, Tim, again, thank you so much. I know your schedule is so busy uh, to kind of come in here break down the mindset, talk about the beautiful game, uh, have good uh, conversation, some in- inspirational messages. Um, so on my end, I truly appreciate you kind of coming on as a guest and giving this um, platform so much light. Um, I want to kind of put it back in your court and um, on your pitch and kind of say any, anything you have new going on, you want to share anything kind of closing thoughts, uh, you want to kind of share with us and we'll go from there. Yeah. Well, first off, Sean, I appreciate you inviting me. Um, I always, always happy to talk the game and, you know, share whatever little bit of knowledge I might have. Um, but no, I mean, we, we're hopeful that we'll have a collegiate fall season coming up. So anybody out there that um, is interested in, um, you know, coming and checking out a UC Riverside game, you know, feel free to reach out. My emails and contact info is on our, our website is GoHighlanders.com, um, so feel free to go there and reach out to me. I'd be happy to to try and um, you know get you some opportunities to watch our team play, or even come out and watch a training session. Our sessions are always open, um, so reach out. I'd be happy to to share whatever we're preparing for that day and talk to you about why we're doing it. Um, for me, that's a big thing is is sharing the knowledge from a coaching standpoint. Um, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I try to get out and watch a lot of training sessions from you know, professional levels down to, to rec levels because I think you can always learn something from somebody. Um, so, yeah, feel free to get in touch and stay in touch and hopefully the game continues to grow and um, one day maybe the U.S. will be hoisting the World Cup trophy. Hopefully, hopefully. Thank you. Yeah.